Getting started in Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord is an exciting prospect filled with endless options and lots of beheading in your near future. Whether you choose to become a famous trader of Calradia, a horse archer, or knight, there are a lot of different ways to approach Bannerlord. Oftentimes this can lead to analysis paralysis where it comes to your first or maybe even returning build for Bannerlord. And in this video, I want to help with just that, setting you up with a good functional beginner build for your first playthrough of Bannerlord. And let me start out by saying that you can effectively play the game however you want and still have an absolute blast. So please don't feel pressured to min max this initial stage. Go. Explore, have fun with everything, and then decide what you want. This should be treated more as a primer to help you get started on the direction of the character you want to build. Or you can follow it to a T. Whatever helps you break into the game, just don't feel like there are any wrong choices. I've broken this video up into chapters that you can find in the timeline and the description covering all the many points that we'll be hitting today. But in short, we'll be discussing cultural bonuses, initial character creation, skill choices, perk selection, how attribute and focus points work, some gear choices, and then go over party members uh, that you might want in your, well, party. So feel free to navigate to whatever part of the video makes the most sense for you. And if you've not yet picked up Bannerlord, you can do so using the link in my Nexus store, I'm sorry, to my Nexus store, which will get you a Steam key directly from the developer. It's a great way to support the channel as well as liking, subscribing, or leaving a comment if you do enjoy the video. But let's get going on my starter build for Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. So to start us off, we're going to go through the cultural bonuses and how to select them. Um, as a, just a really quick note, you have a choice between New Campaign and Sandbox. I would recommend Sandbox, uh, the main story quest campaign right now. Um, as of the creation of this video, it doesn't have its voice lines integrated. There are some bugs, and as a whole, it's very bare bones. It's set to be fleshed out a little bit more closer to launch. So I would just go with Sandbox. It lets you just dive into the game. Don't have to worry about the main story. So when it comes to cultures... One thing I will say is choose the culture that you want to either role play as or maybe you enjoy the aesthetic of the most because as of this point in the game, when you select this culture in Sandbox, you will then start in that region. So if you choose, say choose Volandia, you'll start with all the Volandians. So if you like, say, the uh, prototypical Western uh, European knight, then Volandia is for you. If you like more of the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire, late Roman Empire look, then the Empire is for you. So that's from an aesthetic standpoint. But if we're talking strictly about the actual bonuses, let's go over these really quick because almost all of them, for the exception of Batania, apply to a specific style of play. So Volandia is going to give you bonuses to being a mercenary and it's going to give production bonuses to villages that are bound to castles. Um, every single one of these is going to have a it's going to have two pros and one con. The con here is recruiting lords to armies costs twenty percent more influence. So it is a little bit harder to have larger armies in Volandia. Um, for Sturgia, you got recruiting and upgrading infantry troops are 25% cheaper. Armies lose 20% less daily cohesion, meaning the armies stay together for longer and you have to worry about less issues with food and what have you. 20% more relationship penalty though from kingdom decisions. So anytime you uh, go to enact a kingdom decision and you have people oppose it, there's 20% more of a, of a a relationship penalty when they oppose the decision and it doesn't pass for them or whatever the, the contrary uh, selection is. So for Empire, get 20% less garrison troop wages. Being in an army brings 25% more influence. Um, we'll go over what influence, renown, and gold are. They're your three kind of currencies. We'll go over that later. But this helps in the later portions of the game. And village hearths increase 20% less. So what that means is villages grow larger and more wealthy slower because hearth is the overall amount of homes in those cities. Or I'm sorry, in those uh, towns or villages, villages. <laughs> and for Azurai, caravans are 30% cheaper to build, 10% less trade penalty, no speed penalty on desert, and then daily wages of troops in the party are increased by 5%. Kazate recruiting and upgrading mounted troops are 10% cheaper and 25% production to horse, mule, cow, and sheep in villages. So meaning that the yield of the production of that trade resource is a quarter larger. 20% less tax income from towns. And then for Batanians, we've got 50% less speed penalty and 15% site range bonus in forests. Towns owned by Batanian rulers have one, a plus one mil militia production, meaning that their, militia, their, militias, their militias produce faster. 10% uh, slower build rate for town projects and settlements, meaning when you want to build things in any town or any settlement, city, whatever it is, castle, um, it's going to be 10% slower. So 
of all six of these, there's a certain play style that kind of hinges on each one, right? Belandians is more of a mercenary style, right? Do you want to be a mercenary captain jumping from faction to faction? Well, maybe Volandia is then for you. Do you want to be an infantry general leading a large pocket of infantry, less of an emphasis on any type of horse archers or mounted cavalry, right? Then that's Sturgians. Do you want to be someone who is maybe an army general or a vassal that is a part of armies? Maybe it's empire then for you because being in armies brings you 25% more influence, which is quite nice. Or do you want to be a trader going around and peddling your wares here and there? Then Azurai is definitely going to be the one for you because caravans are 30% cheaper and 10% less trade penalty. Or maybe lastly, you want to be you know, like a rider of Rohan, a horse lord then that's Kazate because recruiting and upgrading mounted troops is 10% cheaper. I would worry very little about the negative bonus. Negative bonus, is that really a thing? The negative trait of all of these cultural bonuses because it's not really that drastic and you won't really experience it much in the early campaign. I will say though that of all of them, Batania is personally very weak. The speed penalty and sight range bonus in forests, there are very few forests on the map that you'll be part of in mass, and that militia production either is not going to ever benefit you or it won't benefit you into the late game. So I, if you want to choose like a true min-max, go with these first five, maybe Kazate if you really want to stick with horse archers, which is going to be the focus of this build. Um, but outside of that, you can really go with whatever culture you want, Batania being kind of the weakest one as far as overall bonuses go. Now moving into initial character creation, you can go through the prompts on a role play standpoint, right? If you want, if you want to say, hey, I want this character to have this feel to it. But this is the character I've created for this build in mind, because again, we're going to be focusing on a horse archer style of build. So what I've done here is gone and chosen family, early childhood, adolescence, youth and young adulthood according to this path. So you can go ahead and copy this if you so wish. I am Kazate as the culture. That will dictate each one of these options. Each culture has a different focus when it comes to these options and what they can maximize. So for example, um, Sturgia is the only culture that will allow you to start with max focus points into roguery. So every single culture has got different focal focus points. Volandia, I believe it's uh, riding and polearm. They're knights. Makes sense. So... Go with what you either want to from a from a roleplay standpoint or copy mine and do this to equal the stats and focus points we have on the left. Starting age, I've gone with 30 because it gives us four unspent focus points and two unspent attributes. And the big thing here is that we're going to be focusing on vigor, endurance, social, and intelligence. Yes, of course, control as well because we'll be using a bow, but... It's important to get our riding up faster than bow because our riding skill is going to dictate a penalty to both our one-handed and to our um, bow. So getting this up faster is going to be very crucial. Now, when it comes to social and intelligence, we'll be focusing on steward a lot, and I'll show you how to do that in just a little bit. But social, we're mainly working on charm. And having three focus points and four um, attribute points into social is going to allow that to increase quite quickly. So this is your initial character creation. What I would go with to just kind of start off to have a very nice maximized build. You will start to look at stuff like um, athletics and other things as you go further into the game. But this gets you off to a really nice start. A quick note on difficulty too before we progress into skill choices. Um... Take a look down here at the very bottom. You have clan member death possibilities, enable birth uh, and death, auto allocate clan member perks, and then Iron Man mode. Let's just go over these four. So this is gonna dictate whether or not your clan members can die in combat. So realistic means that they've got a chance to die. You can either reduce that by 50 or 100%. If you're just starting out and you're trying to learn the game, do 100%. I just recommend that that's a good way to start out because this way you don't have to worry about building a party and have them die off and not understanding why. Enable birth and death is basically the capability for, so you choose if heroes are able to age and reproduce. This option cannot be changed later. I think you should turn this on. It makes the game dynamic and feel alive. Auto allocate clan member points, keep that off. And Iron Man mode makes it so that the game will only have one save and that's it. So if you want that challenge and you, don't, you, you can't save scum as it were, then go ahead and turn this on. Um, but I think if you're just starting off, you can go ahead and leave that off. The rest of this, if you put it on realistic, it's going to be very hard. 
but I think that you should put keep it on realistic to learn through a real trial by fire. And it is the way everyone really plays after the first couple hours of the game. So that's just a quick note on difficulty. Let's jump down to some skill choices and explanation. So here we are, we're outside of the character creation screen and we have all of our skills to take a look at. Now, the way the game works is for every focus point in the beginning, it's gonna invest 10 points into that skill that's changed from the start of the game. And I do have a character creation guide that goes over the finer points of how these focus points, learning rate and attribute points work. You can find that linked in the upper right corner. We will briefly go over that in this video, but that I go a little bit more in depth in that video um, to give you a better idea of how this all works. So taking a look here at our skills, we have got our big focuses. We're going to be focusing on one-handed skills, bow, riding, charm, steward, and then as kind of like a last one, athletics. Those are the primary ones we're going to focus on with this build. Yes, you should also be focusing on leadership and trade and uh, maybe even two-handed or pull arm, but that's down the road. This is just to kind of get you off the ground and get started with everything. So when it comes to one-handed, this is going to be your primary melee skill. It's an awesome one that you can use in close quarters, on horseback, in sieges, in everything. And the ways to increase it are going to be very self-explanatory. Fight with a one-handed weapon. It's pretty self-explanatory, like I said. But all skill points for combat weapons can be, or experience for combat weapons, can be increased depending upon how the damage you do is done. So if you're on horseback, riding at full tilt, and you hit someone in the head and kill them, you'll get more experience than if you're on foot and hit someone in the hand and don't kill them. So pretty much, there are it's the difficulty of the hit, and that's both in all of the vigor skills and in all of the control skills. So if you were to hit someone in the head with your bow, you get more experience than if you were to hit someone in the hand or foot, right? Perform difficult shots from a long distance to get more experience, which brings us into our next skill, which is gonna be bow. You are going to be on horseback, and with a bow and arrow, it gives you an ability to kind of have a little bit of a buffer in between the actual combat coming your way. You can weaken someone up, you can actually take care of fighting against packs of looters on your own if they're a small amount and you kind of have a good idea of how to get those uh, initial shots off. But bow is very strong. It can be used in field battles. It can be used expertly in siege defense or offense. It's a really great ability and it's not as slow as crossbow and it does not suffer from ammunition issues like throwing does. Throwing is stupid strong, but you only get a couple shots. And if you miss any of those, you've just lost a whole a huge amount of damage potential. Next up is riding. Now, why we focused on riding rather than athletics? Because you will want to focus on athletics. If you're doing an arena or if you're in a siege, you don't want to be moving around slow as hell. But if we click over this button, we can see now that they added this a couple patches ago, but it says mounted weapon damage penalty, 18%. Mounted weapon speed and reload penalty is 18%. Every five points, that drops by 1% until it gets to zero and then it just kind of goes away. This is to deter people from just choosing a bow and arrow from the start and being gods. You're still gonna be strong, but you won't be as strong. So you build your writing skill early and this allows you to get really good with bow and arrow fast. And we'll go over perk choices later, don't worry about that. Next up in the social category, we've got charm and charm is gonna be primarily increased by doing any kind of actions with other notables, either breaking them out of prison, which is a huge one, which gets you a ton of charm, talking to them and trading and bartering with them, uh, releasing them. If you uh, get into a fight with them and you actually get them as a prisoner, you can release them and it'll give you a ton of charm experience. There are a ton of ways. Pretty much talking and doing anything or doing bartering will increase your charm skill and it can get very strong very fast, especially at the very end of this. Then lastly, we've got Steward. Now, Steward is very important because it allows you to increase the size of your party. If I click this button, it says, if you are the Quartermaster, it increases your party size by right now at zero because we've got zero points. But remember, we put our attributes in here to three rather than two, giving us a bigger learning rate, which we'll go into in just a little bit here. But the way that you increase your Steward skills succinctly and very easily is by having a lot of food variety. So if you look in the lower right corner here, it says food variety plus seven. So simply just having a lot of different types of food in your inventory and running around, your steward skill is going to soar up. So don't worry about this one being a hard one to raise, but it is an absolute necessity to raise for your character so you can have a nice, large military. 
The other things that would increase your military are leadership and your clan tier. As you progress through clan tier, it's going to give you access to more companions and increase your um, party size. I think right now, our what's our party size here? Uh, that's not party. Our party size here is 20. Uh, once you get to the second clan tier, I think it jumps up to like 50 or 70. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. But those are our focus points. So let's now jump into some perk selection and then how to allocate some of these attribute points and some of these um, uh, focus points. And let's actually talk about focus and attribute points first. I was going to do the uh, perks, but I think this is more important. So the way that this works is if you look over here, you see the learning rate. This shows you your base rate, the rate that you are getting a bonus from your attribute, and the rate you're getting a bonus from your focus point. Now, these all have diminishing returns. As you maximize your attributes and your focus points, these numbers will increase, but they'll increase less over time. So let's say, for example, we've got two, we've got four focus points. So let's just jam all four into this. You saw how our, our learning rent, our learning rate went from four to nine. So looking at just one goes by 1.25, another 1.25, another 1.25. Hey, you guessed it. A lastly, a 1.25. But as our skill increases, these focus points do less and less, and they rely more and more on our attributes. So let's take a look at this now. Learning rate, vigor, 1.5. Click this, increase this. So now, vigor goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. vigor goes up another 0.5. Do it again. Now, vigor is up 2.5. And we increase these, all four of our focus points into this. You can see it's at a learning rate of 10. So each experience point, you're now going to get that much more experience. This is crucial. And I'm not going to go into much more detail other than that, because like I said, I covered it in another in another video. But it's important to know that in order to get a skill to max to 275, and that's not the max for the skill, it's the max for perks. It's five focus points needed, so all five of these, and seven attribute points. So if we wanted one-handed to go to 275 skill, we need five focus points in it, and this number needs to be seven. That can get you to around 300 in total, but the, I think like the soft cap on actual uh, skills is like 1,000, so you can go very, very high with your skills. But basically, your skills, your learning rate, and your attribute are all play into one another. So you wanna focus on the ones that make the most sense first. So if we're just starting off right out the gate, what I would do, Pop one point here, one point here, maybe even two to be totally honest. And let's put another point here into bow because one handed is going to go up very quickly. And I'm going to take my attribute point and put it into control to bring us up to a three, three, four, and three, pretty much all the important ones. And I'm going to put another attribute here into intelligence. So that's how I would start this build out. Put all my primary ones that I want to get good with right here into three and all my, uh, my other ones here into four. If you don't want to focus as much into combat, you could put another point here into athletics to get athletics going. In fact, that's probably where I'd put my next focus point into athletics to get this to two or three. So that's increasing at a nice rate. But right now, as you can see, that's not a big of an issue. As your skills progress, if you don't invest in these focus points and these attributes, this learning rate will go down to zero. So you will learn zero experience for any skill you use if you do not have the proper focus and attribute points put into it. Lastly, before we talk about perks, uh, there is learning limit. So as you allocate your focus points and your attributes, you'll increase this little, little thing here and increase this green bar across the way. That is your learning limit. So anything over that, so once I get to 61 points, I actually get a penalty from earning experience. This forces you to invest in both the attribute and the skill focus to increase that learning limit. So doing that will enable you to continue to earn experience. That's a quick note I forgot to talk about. Now moving into perks, we've got all of our perks selected up to skill level 125. Um, I even think you could probably say 120 is the end of the beginner portion of the game, the early portion of the game. In fact, you might not hit this for some time, but I figure this is a good little kind of leeway into how to allocate some of these perk points. So one thing that to note before even looking at the attributes or the bonuses of each perk is these parenthetical notations. So look at Basher. It says personal slash captain. Some of these will say personal slash governor. Some will say party leader. Where is it? Where is it? 
where is it? Some will say party leader slash governor. So that depends upon your role. Are you the captain, the party leader? Is it a personal one? Is it a governor? Is it a specific party role like it is for steward? We'll say quartermaster. Pay attention to those. You are a party leader. Your main character will almost always be a party leader unless you join an army that is run by someone else. Then you will be a captain if you are selected to be a part of a unit. You can say, hey, you, I'm going to be the captain of this unit. That is the only time that that um, perk bonus will take effect. So it's divided. The first line is the first parenthetical notation, followed by the second line is the second one. So personal one-handed weapons you wield have their handling increased by 20%. That's always going to be active. But if you're the captain of a unit, troops in the formation you are leading have their one-handed combat effectiveness as if they were one tier higher. So just be mindful of that when you're selecting your perks. And here's the ones I've selected. Handling to increase that. We have swing speed increase for one-handed weapons. You could go with, to be blunt, if you want to use axes and maces more. I typically go with swords on horseback. They have better reach. Cavalry here, because your one-handed weapons uh, increase their damage while they're mounted by 5%. And then Duelist, because I've opted for this build to use one hand weapon, a bow and two quivers. You can use a bow, one quiver, one weapon, and a shield. That depends upon how you want to play. That would then dictate how you might choose one of these. But for these two, I've chosen one that focuses more on the captain bonus because the both of them are focusing on using a shield, which I'm not using. Moving into bow, we've got bow control, which decreases your bow accuracy loss due to movement by 30%. This is nice, um, especially if you're in a siege. Ranger swiftness decreases the penalty to movement speed for reloading by 50%. Then we've got quick adjustments, decreases your bow accuracy loss due to rotating by 50%. You're going to be rotating a lot on horse, trust me. You've got mounted archery, decreases mounted accuracy penalties by 30% while using a bow. Obviously, we're going to be using that a lot. And then strong bows here, so it increases your damage with bows by 8%. Moving into riding, we get pretty much the bottom line here. Increase your maneuvering by 10%. Maneuvering is basically, you've got horse speed and maneuverability. Speed is obviously moving in a straight line. Maneuverability is the ability for your horse to pivot left, right, how it turns, how tight those turns are, stuff like that. So again, maneuvering, just in case you wanted a difference of what those two words mean. Now for this one, you get well strapped, increases your mounts hit points by 20%, and mounts of your commanded troops have 10% more hit points because take a look, this is personal slash party leader very important. The other one here is also still really good, halves the chance of your mount becoming lame or dead after it falls in battle, but I'd rather just go with more hit points so that my mount doesn't die in battle. Then we get nomadic traditions. Mounted infantry increases your party speed by 30%. This allows you to have any kind of mounts in your inventory being allocated to your infantry while traveling on the campaign map. They move much faster, so it's a very nice boon in my opinion. Sagittarius, which also is my zodiac sign, decreases accuracy penalty by 15% while you are mounted. This is always going to be huge. And then lastly, you don't get a choice here. Relief Force, if you join an ongoing battle of your allies, your party starts with plus 10 battle morale. Quite nice. Now, while athletics was not part of the primary focus, you will be using it quite a lot in your journeys. So I've gone through it here. Just choose the top whole line right here. Um, Increase movement speed by 3%. This one is massive. Form-fitting armor decreases, decreases your armor weight by 15%, which is awesome. Slightly increases your persuasion chance. Uh, increase your damage by 4% with all melee weapons. And then lastly, decreases your charge damage taken by 50%. Either one of these you can choose. It doesn't really matter. Just go with whatever one you want. For charm, we're going to go with self-promoter, gain five influence by winning a tournament, and gain one morale while in a besieged settlement. You're probably not going to use the latter as much, and this one is virile here is for having more children. So if you want more children, go with that, but for the most part, this is good for your early playthrough. Then from there, we're going to go with the bottom portion here. So increase influence gain from battles by 30%. Every time you defeat an enemy lord, you gain one relationship with a random lord of your faction, which is always nice. And influence is huge. It is one of the three currencies, which we'll talk about in just a little bit here. Now you've got meaningful favors, 10% better chance for double persuasion success versus the other one, 20% chance to avoid personal uh, avoid persuasion critical failure. I like the chance to have uh, success more so than the... Uh, avoiding a critical failure. So that's personal preference, I suppose. 
Young and respectful, respectful increase any relationship gain with the same gender by 20%. The contrary to this is opposite gender. I'm playing a male character and I find that there are a lot of pivotal male characters in the game, so I've gone with this. If you're playing a female character, you can go with the opposite gender to get that same bonus, basically. Um, then you get another choice here that's personal. 30% less influence cost when voting for proposals made by other people. This assumes you're going to be a vassal and a member of another kingdom. This one, Firebrand, 50% less influence cost to initiate kingdom decisions, more assumes that you're going to become the ruler of a kingdom. I assume for your first playthrough, you don't want to do that because it's very challenging and you want to learn the game. So be a vassal to start. This one makes a lot of sense. Lastly, we've got steward here. So we got the top line. So uh, party wages are 5% less, which is better than a party consumes 10% less food. You can always buy more food. Now take a look at these. They all say quartermaster and party leader for, or I'm sorry, all of them have quartermaster in there. So pay attention to that. You want to select yourself as the quartermaster or you're just assumed to be it in your party anyway. So wages are less. All troops gain two percent, or sorry, two daily experience. Reduce food consumption while in an army by ten percent. Companion wages and recruitment fees are reduced by twenty-five percent, which is nice because companions can be quite a bit costy. Um, and then discarded weapons can be donated to troops or increased to experience. Right now, you can donate armor, but with this perk, you can donate weapons and armor to your troops to increase their experience. So this is just all the perks that we'll be selecting for our 125 skill build here on our character. And you can also take a look too at our um, attributes and skill focus points right here, right? Four, four, five, four, and four. I put five here because I wanted athletics to get up faster and I put five focus points into it. So it's learning rate is at 10X. But just to kind of give you a, a quote unquote end game build of what the beginner build would look like. When it comes to gear, you really can get away with pretty much everything you find. In the early portions of the game, you're going to find a ton of armor and you're just going to keep swapping it off. So don't really worry about it too much. To be totally honest with you, most of the armor you're going to find from either killing enemy armies or from competing in tournaments. And you should be competing in tournaments as often as you can. That's where you would get something like this. A plumed nomad helmet is easily acquired from a tournament. But um, I have a bunch of Kazate armor on because it kind of fits the character I wanted to portray. But every single culture's armor you can find typically in their region's tournaments. But I would just try to find tier 3 or tier 4 armor as fast as you can uh, by killing looters doing bandit stuff, uh, banding, I'm sorry, bandit hideouts, um, attacking minor clans, or by doing tournaments. It's the best way to find it. And just armor's going to come to you in droves, just kind of swap out. And as the game progresses in time, you will find higher tier armor spawning in towns. So if you can't find tier 5 or 6 armor, don't worry, it will eventually populate into a town. Same thing with weapons and bows and arrows and whatnot. On that note, weapon-wise, you start off with an Iron Saber, which is, to be totally honest, a very good, strong weapon to use on horseback. It's got a great length of 90, handling 101, good speed, and great damage for both swing and thrust. So hold on to this. You can use this for a long time until you upgrade to a Steel or Thamaskeen stuff up, up the road. The big thing you're going to focus on is, of course, your bow. Um, you start with your simple... I'm sorry, you don't start with a simple short bow. You start with a different bow. Um, you start with a step bow or a hunting bow, depending upon what you are using. Not to be confused with your step bro, which would be the person that's going to help you get stuck out of your dryer. Now, you want to upgrade your bow as fast as possible. If you can jump to a Nordic sh short bow within short notice, go for it. But I'd really try to spring for a simple short bow. Um, a step recurve bow is just too expensive. Jumping into that fifth and sixth tier is gonna be a huge money sink. So hold off on those. Just try to jump into either the Nordic or simple short bow as fast as you can. They're gonna be your best bet for good early game damage. One thing to keep in mind though when you're choosing a bow is look at these symbols. Not usable with one-handed, not usable with shield. Duh, right? But look at this lowland longbow. If you see the symbol can't be used with mounts, you cannot use it until you get the appropriate bow skill which will allow you to use uh, bows on mounts, all bows on mounts. So just be mindful of that. You don't look at, say, a practice longbow and go, oh, this is really good. I'm going to pick this up. Don't do it. Well, a terrible bow. A longbow and go, this is really good. I'm going to pick this up. Don't do it. Um, and one final note here is on your horse. As of some of the more recent patches, 
horses will slow down according to the armor on them. So stick with a harness of some sort, something that's pretty lightweight. You don't want to go too heavy because it'll slow your horse down. And your horse choice should be something with a good amount of speed, but a high amount of maneuverability. Maneuverability is the thing that's going to allow you to turn left and right on a dime. Good turning radius. So having a step horse is really good because they've got slower speed, not the slowest. Uh, they've got really good speed, actually, but way higher maneuverability. Compare this to, say, a desert horse, which has very high speed and high maneuverability. It's like 52 and 56, I think, is what it is. Here, we'll take a look together. Um, we can go down and find it somewhere in here. A desert horse, here you go, 54 and 56. So you can see you get more speed but lose maneuverability. Maneuver is key for you as a horse archer. So lastly, I want to talk about your companions. And companions make up a huge part of Bannerlord because now you can actually have your companions become nobles within your clan as you go into a kingdom, all sorts of cool things. But in the early game, there's a lot of questions as to how this works. So let's go into our clan and we can go into parties and we have our current party, our current members and everything of the sort. And you, as you grow in party members, you can assign them to quartermaster, scout, surgeon, or engineer. Like I've said before plenty of times, you always want yourself to be the quartermaster, and if you've got no companions or you haven't assigned any companion to a role, you are assumed that role. But the first one you want to find is Surgeon, because as you can see here, Casualty Survival Chance, Healing Rate Increase for Heroes and Troops, those are the three big things that you want, and you're going to get that from having a Surgeon. So you want to find that quickly. So the way to do this here is you're going to press N. I'm going to press N and we'll go to this screen. This, this would be what you would see to bring up your encyclopedia. I'm going to go to Heroes. And we're going to make sure that this is checked. Wanderer. You want Wanderer to be checked. Those are your wandering companions. Now, this list will populate and depopulate. Uh, wanderers will come and go. So at the very beginning of your game, if you don't see the best healer, which would be an Azurai scholar, then it's okay. They might actually come into the game later. Just go ahead and find anyone that says, let's go ahead and look here, anyone that has the healer or the surgeon in their uh, title. Those are going to be your other options for healer. You can choose other characters too. I think, um, where is it? I think Bitter Draft has some healing. No, that's just Charm. It has Charm. But let's take a look here at a Fanus. So I've never seen him before. And this healer, Emulier, I've never seen her before. Typically, and this is just kind of a loose rule of thumb, if you look at their culture in the very beginning of the game, you can go to that culture's region and typically find that character. Um, they do move pretty quickly. So if you are, say, starting in Kazate and you're running all the way to Vlandia, expect the character to have moved. And you can find characters you've already seen by jumping in and out of a town. Let's go to Tavern District here. Well, I can see this guy. He is not a companion that I want right now, so I'm going to go to the next town and just kind of keep looking. It's really the fastest way to do things. And I'm going to just go ahead and do some cheating right now. We're going to go ahead and warp on over to this location and go into this town. Tavern District. Oh, the bull. This guy's Empire, but Frostbeard here, he's Sturgeon. So they're already starting to move around. And this guy actually would make for a great scout, a great early starting scout. So you can go ahead and pop him in to your, uh, to your party if you so wish. So one thing I just want to talk about very quickly, though, before we kind of uh, close our video out here, is the discussion of which companions to choose. Like I said, go for your Surgeon, then go for your Scout, and after that, just choose whatever characters you want to be the captains of your respective formations. So let's look at... Sturgia usually has good Axemen and stuff like that. Coalbiter here. This guy's got 200 hand, 200 two-handed experience, 150 one-handed, and 170 polearm. This guy would be a great infantry commander because he probably has a lot of perks that will give his captaincy bonus to all those formations. Or conversely, let's look at... This character will do. Um, riding, bow, and one-handed. He could possibly have perks that make him a great horse archer captain or a great cavalry commander, um, just normal heavy cab. 
Or maybe if I look at Volandia, the Brave I think is a good one. Yeah, Brave has got good pole arm and good horse riding. So choose your companions based off of maybe a, a, a thematic or a role player after. But if you're looking from a stat perspective, that's what you'd look for. Is someone that is really good in specific role to be the captain of the formation that that unit would then take advantage of. So again, if you wanted to have my infantry soldiers, athletics, one-handed, Two-handed or pull arm, those would all be great things that would give bonuses to your infantry uh, commanders. Or bow, if I wanted to do it for my archers, or crossbow for my archers as well. And I did say I'd talk about some currency, so something I do want to talk about very quickly are your three types of currency. And it's not necessarily, it's really two types of currency, to be totally honest. You get your dinars, your gold, you're going to get that however you're going to get that. But influence, you've noticed that a lot of these things in the perks section have said influence. Influence is what you're going to use to do um, any kind of kingdom decisions, vote on kingdom decisions, and more importantly, if you're a mercenary, your influence is what is going to pay you. So just, I wanted to point that out that it is a thing. And the other thing that's not necessarily a um, currency, but it's important is your renown. Because renown is what progresses your clan tiers. And clan tiers, which of course give you more companions, increase party size, you can be a mercenary, you can become an owner of a kingdom, you can be a vassal. All these things are tied to your clan tier number. And so renown is an important thing to grow. You'll do this by doing any kind of quests, uh, doing tournaments, being a mercenary or a vassal and getting in conflicts, all these things will increase your renown. Even just killing things will increase your renown. But it's important to know, I just wanted to talk about those three things because I said I would earlier in the video. So this is me just kind of tying up that loose end. So at that, it brings our video here to a close. So hopefully this gives you a really good idea of a nice starter build for jumping back into the game. There is a lot of nuance of other things that we didn't go into, and I have a whole ton of guides that you can find linked at the end of this video. Some of them are out of date, and I will be updating them as we get closer to launch, and a lot of mechanics have started to solidify. But if you have any questions or you're struggling with anything, go ahead and let me know in the comments section below. I'm going to provide links to anything relevant as far as other guys I've done in their respective sections. But if you like this and you would like maybe a next step video, like, hey, I got the beginner build down, but what do I do after that? What's like the advanced steps after I've kind of done the uh, the original steps of the game? Let me know in the comment section. Any feedback would help me in making guides that help you guys jump into Bannerlord, either coming back into it or just picking it up before or during the launch or the full launch of Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.